trying to get crazy with this scene. Don't you know I'm local? That was in the 70s. That was born in the 70s, so there wasn't uh, anything but really graffiti at that point. Uh, street art street art and graffiti are different things. I like to make sure we understand that, and I know you two do. But that's not a term that developed until the 1980s. And, and that's the time of Keith Haring, Jean-Michel Basquiat, uh, folks were working in New York where they were influenced by so many of the graffiti artists on the East Coast. What's happening, everybody? This is Bobby Ruiz, a.k.a. Bobby Tribal. And once again, it's time for that Lower Left Podcast. I'm here with my man, Johnny B. Good. What's happening, Johnny? Um, not much, except the torta right here that keeps <laughs> calling me. It smells in here like good food. And uh, although I ate already, I might eat again. So. I'm, I'm a force feeder. <laughs> yeah. A giver, a nurturer, yeah. right? You just... Well, uh, shout out Tortas Corazon. Um you know when the food trucks are here, we gotta we gotta make sure they stay busy. So, but shout out them, they do the, the best tortas. So, yes, I was telling uh, Bobby earlier, smell like In and Out outside. I'm like, oh, you know that food's good when it <laughs> smells like that. Yep, he gets down, he pulls up, and then he'll cook for like an hour or two, and then he'll just let us know when he's ready. But it's always always fresh, fresh. Isn't that like In and? <laughs> 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 so, anyways. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if the listener viewer has heard, but I've been extremely busy lately working on what I would consider probably one of the largest projects that that I've ever took on. Um, and it's a, it's a show that's happening in June called Street Legacy. There's no way I could have done this show without our guest today. Um, he's uh, And this is the, f- the first time that I've actually done or worked with... Uh, uh, a museum or an institution. So it's the show is called Street Legacy. It's at California Center for the Arts in Escondido. It's just picture like a like a high school size campus with uh, theaters and it has a museum and it has a conference hall and it has a lawn and it has, you know, courtyards and stuff like that. Beautiful, beautiful place. But anyways, um, our guest today is is uh I consider him a good friend now we met a few years back he is a badass on another level I can't look at him and say this cause it's- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but he really is I have I have a a ton of respect for this guy like not just his credentials but just how how he carries himself in so many different types of circles like he comes to the building he's completely comfortable he's uh just a, a real good dude so he's a Man, I don't even know where to start. I'm not sure what you're going to say. I don't know. Maybe. I don't even know where to start with this guy. <laughs> but yeah, besides being a good friend, so his just just so you know a little bit about him, he's the he's a, a dean at Point Loma Nazarene University. He's a professor. He's uh, an art critic. He is a, and not not just an art critic because we're all art critics, but he's a professional art critic. He's an author. He writes for the newspaper. And he's written several books. I think he has six books he's done on his own with people like uh, Shepard Ferry, Kenny Scharf. Um, he's done books on street art. He's um, he's educated, like highly educated. He's actually a doctor. And sometimes he uses that in front of his name. Sometimes he doesn't. Um, I occasionally call him a couple other things, but we'll leave that. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you for not <laughs> those things. We'll leave that out. But like I said, a, a really good friend. But he's um he went he has a degree from Harvard, he has a degree from Columbia, he has a degree from Boston University. And I don't even know how the hell we got on the, on the podcast. But um, like I said, a great a great great friend, um, Jim Dacian. Yeah, I said it right. Huh? You're perfect. What? Yeah. That was an introduction. You know what? Like no other right there. That's it, dude. He deserves that introduction after all the work that he's put in and and just um you know who he is and and I I know just because of the you know the minor compared to this guy's education that I have how difficult it is to just achieve one degree from one and and not you know he's talking 
PhDs and master's degrees. So I'm, you know, um, and besides that, just, you know, I, I know what he's done since he's come out of school, but, um, an amazing person, like just, just like I said, a badass. in my opinion, you know, there's, it's just a different realm. It's a different, different thing, but you know, just that guy. And, and I think, I know that without him, there's no way this show could have happened because it takes a certain type of language to get into the doors of these institutions that I can't speak on my own. Like I can try, but when you, you know, you come in and people say, Oh, who wrote this letter? Who wrote this email? Oh shit. And they look at how he signs his emails and who he is. People pay attention and they're more likely to, to give it, you know, yeah, the attention that it deserves. But Look at way is too that nice. enough? Is yeah. that enough? No, I Am I done say, or should I keep going? No, I think you're Oh done. wait, I'm, I'm, I left something I out. Gotta go I, now. No, I, I left, gotta go. I left one thing out. I left then this is for real too. And he's a triathlete. Oh, like Iron Man? He, like, he ran Iron Man. Wow. Like he was he, just several months ago, what like six months ago, not even that. Uh, yeah, like four months ago. Four months yeah. ago he did Iron Man down in Cancun. It was uh, Cozumel, Mexico. Cozumel, wow. yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. So there. we'll just leave yeah. it at that because so, I, real, real quick, what did your parents give you? Like how did you <laughs> like what, I just don't know. Like, uh, a lot of blueberries? Yeah, or I don't know. I usually just introduce myself as just a teacher. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I love I love I love writing. I love knowledge and talking about art and thinking about art and when you have a passion for something, it makes projects yeah. like this easy. And just one thing builds up over time. So it doesn't feel insurmountable because it's your own life, so right? See that Nothing word, seems see that special. That Hold on, let me that. Google that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get made fun of my language. But, but uh, yeah, it's just, it's a love of art is really what it's about. And helping others appreciate art in deeper and me- more meaningful ways. That's really what my life's about. That's, that's to say the least. Yeah. But I know he's also he has a dad and he's a, a father and has some great kids yeah. and wife and all that kind of stuff. But anyways, um, wow, I don't even know. So where where were you brought up? Like what was what was it like? Like just you oh, know boy. what was your upbringing like? What I I was well, I was born in the Midwest, so Youngstown, where? Ohio, of uh-huh. all places. And our family moved around every three years. My dad worked in technology and was an engineer and a salesperson, so. We found ourselves in Pennsylvania, then Illinois, then Massachusetts, and back to Il- back to Ohio and Illinois again. Eventually, out to California when I went to college. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we never really settled down in any one place, and I think that's one of the reasons I'm so comfortable making friends and having yeah. to kind of introduce yourself in new contexts quite often. And that's how we met, right? Mm-hmm. It's like I, I basically said, "Hey, you know." Yeah, I think we have something in common. Right. Can, can yeah. we meet? And so I think it gives you some confidence that you can either shy away from that kind of new new situation, new context. But my upbringing was very helpful for that, for sure. Yeah. So the way Jim and I met, he was a uh, he. You were teaching. Well, you had moved to San Diego That's like right. six years ago. Yeah, uh, seven years ago. It's been seven now. It's crazy. From L.A. From L.A. County, mm-hmm. you were you were. Not to you jail. Go ahead to go. No, not yeah. that's what. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> not to jail. So, what were you doing in LA? <laughs> I was I was a professor at Azusa Pacific University. So, out it's near Pasadena, uh-huh. and so that's where I went to undergrad there, and um, was I was asked to apply to the university down here, and so eventually did. W- wasn't sure if it was something that was right for us, but it clearly was in mm-hmm. the long term. So, had had was recent transplant. My wife was from Oceanside. Uh, so we knew some folks in North County, but I was just trying to get plugged into more of the art scene and and having studied a lot of graffiti and street art and knowing a lot of folks in L.A. or some of the other cities I lived in, uh, wanted to connect with San Diego. And mm-hmm. it wasn't long before I came across Bobby's name, uh, wrote an article about Bobby in the paper, and there's a few other mentions and some other pieces that I had written. Mm-hmm. So that's how we met. He He contacted me. To uh, I think it was it. It wasn't for the article first. I think first it was for the show, and then the article came after that. I think that's right. I was curating a show at the Oceanside Art Museum. Uh, street art. Uh, it was a street art show called Sidewalk Activism. It was all politically oriented, social, social, political issues. Uh, was looking. Bobby was part of that show and recommended some artists for that show. Uh, but then that dovetailed into some other projects, including an article in the Tribune about the 35-year anniversary of Tribal, 
Uh, and then we just got talking about other projects, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a lot of common interest amongst the two of us that we... And we talk shit really good. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. On another level. Yeah. yeah. On another we really level. do. It's, he's, he's, he's good at it. And fast, dude. Is it? Like, shh. Isn't that yeah. what critics do, though? Dude. Yeah. Dangerous. Quick. We're bottom quick. feeders quick. for the most yeah. part. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was super quick. But yeah, he was, uh, he was working on that show at the Oceanside Museum and... Uh, so yeah, that was a really cool show. Um, locally, you had all the right guys. You had you know Dyes and Persue and Mike Giant and you know people from LA. Shep- well, Shepard was in it. Yeah, Shepard was. Vile and mm-hmm. um, Gain and Brisk right. and a lot of it was. It was a really good show, and I think the response wasn't what anyone expected. I don't think that museum was shocked. I, I, they knew it was going to be popular. Uh, because just even leading up to it, they were getting calls of folks like, why am I not in this show? Or mm-hmm. how do I, you know, or what is this all about? So just a little bit more chatter. And we had to put out to. some fires. There were definitely fires. There's always a fire. I yeah. feel like anytime you do a show, a group show mm-hmm. with a lot of artists, especially some really larger name artists, mm-hmm. um, I, I feel like every day my Instagram gets. What happened? How, they, how do I get in on they this? They get show? like butt hurt or what? Yeah, like they, not people's feelings them. get hurt for sure. Even mm-hmm. if they don't even live in California or they're not even associated, mm-hmm. I've never met them before, whatever. So somehow mysteriously, you're mm-hmm. supposed to include everybody in the yeah. world. I think what's happening too with this show is because he's still getting some from it and I get some from it, is uh, they think he's going to be nicer. <laughs> <laughs> and then there may be or, or, yeah. or like but you know so we both kind of get hit by people but um you know there's only so much space yeah and there's there's obviously you know we had to make some decisions and collectively him and i and then present things to the museum as well so um street legacy has 97 artists i yeah. think um with uh an installation that i i had a conversation with the guy today um there'll be 98 but um i guess you know, to do a show of this caliber and this, you know, this size with this many artists, it's it's not not real easy. And the 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 great thing or beautiful thing that that I encountered and we both encountered was we got no nos. That's right. Nobody nobody refused, and we went after the people that we thought would be best for the show. And everybody everybody's down, and the the, the the messed up part is, see, I didn't say the bad word there. That was, that was conscious. Good restraint. Conscious. Pretty good. Yeah, that was good. So, um, yeah, the uh, is, you know, everybody wants to get their friend in or, oh, you got to meet this person. Um, you know, hey, is there any way you could get this dude in or, you know, this person in? And it's hard to say no to people. But, you know, at the end of the day, they should be happy they're in it or they were invited. Um, but then also people wanting more space like hey can i get a bigger space can i get you know this size but we are doing our very best and i think we're doing a a really good job of accommodating the people that we feel um can not not best use the space i guess but you know it's it's some people will have more space than others based on what they're going to contribute or who they are yeah and and even if you don't if you're not included in the show your life is long, right? There's, there's <laughs> going to be other shows. Right. And uh, there's folks that were in the Oceanside show that are not in this show. Right. And that's okay. I mean, because right. every show shouldn't be the same. And they're going to have their own conceptual agenda. And that's what we're trying to do. So um, it doesn't mean that there couldn't be something else in the future. And that's the great thing about relationships and moving forward. And exactly. And there'll be progression of other things. But this show that we have coming up at the California Center for the Arts, I think a lot like that Oceanside show. There was a line around the block just to get in the show at opening night. We shut down the computers. They stopped working. They let everybody in. It was a madhouse. Yeah. You could not move. And it was awesome. Yep. It was beautiful awesome. chaos. And there was yeah. an energy in that museum later. Uh, many times we're like, my goodness, I have never seen the museum that packed before. That kind of energy. And then the visitors, you know, the folks who are not artists, the folks who are art appreciators or fans thanking you like we just don't see things like this in north county or san diego that's reflective of the things i'm interested in so that's what i'm excited about this show because Mm -hmm. it's even more diverse there's so many different subcultures and genres of art making and media that are going to be involved that i just think it's absolutely incredible it's gonna be mind-blowing i i i agree 
Like the w- one thing that that I'm I'm excited about too, and and you and I both feel strongly about is bringing in the new names. Like, um, yeah, we have the big names. Um, you know, if you want to hear some of the big names, we'll s- nice. pe- people <laughs> do it. Spill. So, who are yeah. some of the big names? Bob? I would I would say like uh, you know, OG Abel, Risk, Slick, Mister Cartoon, Carlos Torres, Esteban Oriol. Um, you know, Big Sleeps, Dies, um, you know, Mike Giant, just on and on. It, it, it doesn't, you know, Franco Viscovi and it doesn't stop. Like no. all the, all every, every big name that we asked, but there's also some, I think people ha- have a tendency to get stuck on just the big names mm-hmm. and, and forget that there's a whole new generation coming up that are, just as talented and just as badass, but maybe don't get the invitation or don't get the recognition because they're not the big name or they're not in the right crew. So, you know, with that being said, we're definitely bringing some artists that we're going to, you know, provide a platform for that I'm really excited about. You know, there's, there's some guys and, and girls that are, you know, amazing artists that that you'll see and you'll you'll get to know who they are at this show so come and see the you know the the big names and and everybody's creating new works for this show as well as the new names and and get to know some of these artists because they're not going anywhere and this is the next generation that i think that that we're going to bring to surface so yeah absolutely and one of the other thing i love this while it's new work you won't have seen it before there'll be a lot of work on the walls that won't be able to be replicated elsewhere. So it'll exist for a certain amount of time. And then I'm going to take my X-Acto knife or my <laughs> razor. <Yeah. laughs> the shredder. Like, Thanks, right? But that's part of the experience. Yeah. I think that's what's special about it. And it's always problematic when you bring different aspects of street culture, or street art, graffiti inside. It's not really that anymore. But I love when things are temporary or temporal. You mm-hmm. know, like they, they only exist for a moment. It makes it special. And that's what we're trying to create is like a, a, a number of experiences, a la John Dewey, the philosopher, that you can only have at that moment when you visit the museum. It's yeah, it's uh, uh, and and uh, sorry, yeah. I regretted yeah. saying yeah. John Dewey yeah. as soon as <laughs> I, I did. I'm like, well, we're gonna talk. About, gonna exp- we're gonna get to that Wait, guy. That, that <laughs> is he from the Dewey Decimal System? <laughs> <or>? <laughs> John, John Dewey's my favorite uh, American philosopher. So he was a professor at Columbia University, early 20th century, but wrote uh, Art as Experience. And his philosophy of art is something I subscribe to. Is art is a series of experiences as a beginning and an end. Art isn't the actual thing you see on the wall. The art happens between the viewer and the artwork when you're asking questions and getting something from the artwork. And then when you end that experience, that's when the art ends. So art exists as an experience. That's fucking badass. Nice. Right I'm sorry I cussed. But that's okay. That's how uh, how impressed I am. <laughs> yeah. Art is, you know, knowledge like that, that we're not used to. Like, it's it's great to know. Oh, and, that, you know, and not not to to go back and, and, you know, keep pumping up Jim, but I've learned so much from this guy. like. He took me to an art opening, um, you know, and I, I've, I've, you know, I've curated a bunch of shows and I've pretty, you know, I've been to some of the bigger museums around the world and I'm pretty familiar with art and I feel comfortable and I've worked with hundreds, maybe thousands of artists over the last 33 years, but walking the show, he was teaching me things. I'm like, whoa, really? And he's, you know, about metaphors and, yeah, and was... renaissance painters and and lighting and and the people that influence other people like the other day um i was i was having a conversation with one of the artists in the show who's a great friend of mine gustavo rimada who is doing an amazing piece for the show and uh you know he we're discussing some options and things he was doing and he referred to a gentleman by the name of i can't pronounce it what's his name which was I there? No, I sent you the name, and I go. This guy's mind blowing. He was he was from the fort fourteen hundreds. He died in fifteen sixteen. Who were the guy who about? I'm telling you who I I think influenced Dolly? I'm trying to remember who we talked about. Uh, yeah, I have no clue. I was gonna spout out some names, but. Um, uh, we're talking about Harmonious Bo- Bosch, uh, yes. the Garden of Earthly Delight. Sorry, it took yes. me for a minute there. <laughs> we're going to slow like, that when down. When are we talking Let's about? Let's slow that name Let's down. So Bosch, yeah, his Harmonious name. Bosch, um, 
early Renaissance painter. Uh, but what's crazy, right, is that it blew my mind. Yeah, like, I was just it was so ultra contemporary. Well, yeah, and San Diego Museum of Art has far out. one of his pieces, but yeah, some of his most well known pieces. But that painting are in Europe. is called the what? Uh, that is not the one at the museum in San Diego, the one that Gustavo referred. Oh, to. the garden of earthly delights. It's a triptych. So it's three, it's a three panel piece that folds in like, um, like an altar mm-hmm. piece that you would find in a church. So it opens like this and it has three depictions of, um, you know, what the garden looked like before sin, when sin entered the world and then kind of like hell afterwards. Yeah. And, and there's, chickens eating people and you know bodies flailing and being cut open little demons kind of flying out it's but it's insane it's an insane but the buildings building. those buildings that look like dolly-ish yeah you can say definitely influenced pop surrealism you can see a little bit of that surrealism was there sure. anybody before him not quite like that he was an enigma for sure uh in the way he existed because you think about artwork during that time um you know, during the Renaissance or even afterwards with the Academy, it was all about ideal forms and uh, depicting the human and uh, everything perfect. I, the way I always describe it with students is everybody looks like they have a, they've always had a membership to 24 hour fitness, you know, like everything's <laughs> yeah. perfect. Yeah. The only way you can tell age is the color of the beard or the length of the beard or the color of the hair, right? So older men and younger men look exactly the same <laughs> ideally. But their hair color changes or their beard changes. And that's how you can tell age with uh, Renaissance paintings or Mm -hmm. academic paintings. And so Bosch is like so crazy unique because he didn't subscribe to a lot. It almost looks cartoony, stylized figures. Uh, So it gets super wild. You could Especially call it, for that time period. Oh, yeah. Even now you could look at the painting and some of the forms in the painting and they're just futuristic. Yeah, for sure. I would say the the context in which it took place, that triptych and that, you know, looks like it belongs in a church. Or and even so um, the Disney, there. like there's on, on the third panel, there's a character that kind of has a, a broken back part. It looks like something out of like and, uh, Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, that, I think that's fair. Alice in Wonderland would make sense because uh, it is fairy tale like over overall. So, yeah, uh, I mean, that's. 1490 to 1500 is Imagine about when that. it was painted. Imagine that, dude. That's a long time for yeah. that art to Four, like, that's survive. What's, what's the math on that, Jim? Six, seven hundred. I used seven hundred. Six, seven hundred. Old school years? calculator. Well, fifteen. Sixty something. <laughs> what is it? Like so, something like that? Yeah, it's about five hundred years. <laughs> but what were they painting with? Uh, the oil paints. So you have oil paint at that point. Uh, but, it used to be egg tempera. But, but yeah. on, and the contrast of that is what was happening in this part of the world during that same time period. Right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, usually who is commissioning works like this? Because prior to that, uh, it, well, even during this time, it's the church, you know, or it's wealthy patrons. So you didn't see a lot of experimentation by artists doing like, personal things that the way we have contemporary art looks like today it's like Mm -hmm. i do art for me or i'm trying to express myself (laughs) no you didn't do that you had a patron you had someone who's going to pay for it's hard for us to imagine that you know who were the wealthy folks uh that would do that that changed as the church lost more power towards the end of the renaissance and that's when you start to see portraiture and things like that become more popular because i could afford it i don't need to have a painting of a pope in my house or a crucifixion Mm -hmm. but this uh that garden of earthly delights is very personal very expressionistic it's an odd interpretation of scripture in general and and like i said (laughs) shout out to to the to my homie gustavo rimada for for hipping me to that and, and sharing Gust- that with Gustavo me. does kind of like yes. that kind so of style. Gustavo did a painting for uh Narcos Mexico that was um used at they actually put it it was in Times Square for a while. Mm-hmm. But um it was uh inspired by that painting. That's cool. So he was talking about, you know, maybe without giving too much away, um there's a closed version of that painting. So maybe adding he he I don't anyway, so but um that was that was crazy. So I know you've also you did you've done a TED talk on street art. Right? Yeah. So wow. where where did you see street art? Let's say 
25 years ago versus where it's at now? Uh, so 25, so 19, mid 90s. Feel free to elaborate. Yeah. Because that's, so, that's kind of a, yeah. a broad question, but, you know, street art and graffiti and, what, and that type what, of thing. What, what was your sp- first experience with street art? Because in Youngstown, I imagine there's graffiti everywhere, yeah, yeah, right? But, but. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah. Uh, that's about it. Yeah, mm-hmm. Especially uh, younger, like when, you know, that was in the 70s. I was born in the 70s, so there wasn't uh, anything but really graffiti at that point. Uh, street art... Street art and graffiti are different things. I like to make sure we understand that. And I know you two do, but that's not a term that developed until the 1980s. And, and that's the time of Keith Haring, Jean-Michel Basquiat, uh, folks were working in New York where they were influenced by so many of the graffiti artists on the East Coast, but they were still in art school. Uh, but they wanted to use aerosol cans, but then they were using, instead of, writing letters they were using jetson's characters or you know some some other pop culture reference that would draw more the general public in and those started to distinguish like some of the differences in what street art was it was um, more for the general public and less for uh an in crowd or other writers or other street artists uh which is why those artists took off so quickly i mean they got picked up by galleries you can imagine the gallery scene in new york oh we can sell this this can come inside this can translate even though there were plenty of graffiti artists that did the same thing they did get invited in the gallery they didn't quite have the rise to fame that some of those early artists did so um it it certainly was a novelty it uh kind of went away for a while uh there was a a dip in the art world overall (laughs) a few of those artists died um someone like kenny scharf kind of went into obscurity uh, i would say for a good decade and then we started to see like a, 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 the next generation sort of be influenced by those folks, um, the Barry McGee's, um, you know, folks that were using, again, recognizable imagery, but taking it outside using all the materials from art school. It didn't have to be spray paint anymore. And it wasn't didn't have the same popularity that it has now. Uh, it seemed to catch on fire. Um, what is that? 20 years ago, maybe? not 25, but about 20, you start to see like, that's when Shepard started to, it's not when he started, but he started getting more and more fame. Banksy started, started then five or six years later, all of a sudden you have films about it and documentaries and my goodness, it just seems like we started using it for gentrification projects and and, uh, condo builders would pay for murals on the side of their house that by famous street artists that did things illegally. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's been a odd and strange and wonderful trajectory. I always connect street art to pop art in many ways. I think it's, um, it's an offshoot of it, but I think it's a reversal of it in terms of what pop art was trying to do. And I can say more about that. Uh, that's kind of a loaded thing to say, but yeah, it's, uh, I, I think it has, um, I, I think one could say it's peaked in, in many ways in terms of um, how it's been incorporated into mass culture. I think it's kind of become ubiquitous in, in a way. You know, you kind of see street art everywhere. It doesn't even surprise you the anymore. The NFT thing, like taking it to another level. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 just sort of everywhere. So I, it, But at the same time, you always got to be careful when you talk about history because you never know. Like, what's the next peak and mm-hmm. valley overall? But it's not going away. And I think it's one of the most relevant art movements. And I do think it's a movement, but it's also a genre as well uh, that's happening today, which is why I love talking so much about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a great educational tool. It's a great advocacy tool. Uh, There's so much. And and it's great to collect and talk about. And And and, it's very international now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you think there's any correlation between the street art scene and the social environment of any given decade or time period? Because you mentioned earlier, like during the Renaissance, like the painters painted for whoever was going to pay um, versus like in the eighties and nineties, the way I see it, at least it wasn't very mainstream as it is now. Now artists can create anything and sell it, you know, physical copies, prints, NFTs, like now it's more lucrative for any artist. Incredibly democratic, too, because uh, you can build your own following Mm -hmm. via your social media platform, website, or just, let's just say, within your community. You didn't even subscribe to anything online. And artists are rewarded for their own unique style, 
their own aesthetic, uh, maybe the the messages that they're trying to get, get across, if it's social or political, whatever it may be, or the culture they're trying to represent. You know, they the other people feel like they're part of it. So uh, it's I think it's incredibly empowering time to be an artist. Uh, I recall when I was in grad school that folks kind of mourned this idea of postmodernism, which what we're in. Uh, compared to modernism. Modernism is a series of movements. One would build off one another and you want it to be part of the next movement because that's that was the thing. That's when you know you're onto the trend and you're part of art history where we would say postmodernism, there's no such thing as these movements building off each other. In fact, even a linear idea of history is false. I mean, there's many histories happening at times and one should be able to engage with any movement throughout history or from anywhere in the world, and that's okay with postmodernism because there isn't a pr- proper starting place or a foundation you need to start with. And that celebrates individuality, one's old culture, or how you grew up. I think that's awesome. And that makes a place for everybody at the table. And I think it's much more equitable and exciting uh, in an art world because mm-hmm. of that. So. I like that, like a, a place for everyone, because it's it's now um, I consider it not just graffiti and street art and tattooing to be um, what I would consider probably the most visual art form other than what you're going to see on television or, or um, you know, anyplace else, because tattooing's huge yeah. and there's so much expression in art and, and tattoos and there's the amount of artists that are doing tattoos um, and, and these tattooers, a lot of them came from a graffiti background or, you know, vice versa. They, they're starting to tattoo, but they're starting to, to, um, you know, move into graffiti. And then you have these graffiti writers and I'll use OG Abel as an example. Um, because in my opinion, the guy's a genius. Like just, he can work acrylics. He could work, um, oils. He can work airbrush. He can do amazing things with spray paint and pencil and pen. And then, digitally he's a beast Mm. and it started from his love of graffiti Mm. pretty much and and it's taken him you know around the world and um you know his clothing brand and just everything that he's done and he's a very sharp person in general just takes care of himself his family really really well but i think um just being the most contemporary art form excuse me because it is young Mm-hmm. You know, um, kids, you know, that are late teens or early twenties are excited about getting tattooed or about going, you know, traveling and just looking at street art or even at something as simple as sticker bombing, yeah. you know, it's, it's everywhere. Um, I don't, I don't know. And like, believe it or not, but there's a lot of shit I don't know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but what would you consider another form of or as fast moving and large of a movement an artistic movement that's bigger than say street art graffiti and tattooing yeah that's a good question because as we were talking i I was my first thing was that's one of the reasons i'm glad we're friends because i've learned so much about tattooing from you and been introduced to so many different artists through that and that's um that's not something that would have been considered art in the modern era, mm-hmm. right? And it's and it's still even in theory and postmodernism that yes, it is it, it is an art and it is an, a, a a very valid art form, but it still wrestles with uh, the institutional world mm-hmm. of the art world, whether for they now. accept it or, for now, for sure. And we're we're what we're trying to do is break through that a little bit, absolutely. And and that part it shows like this that help us do that it becomes much more part of the vernacular and the language that we're we're talking about and make people comfortable with how to look at it right mm-hmm. and how to think about it but so much i admire about it is it it the language we use about tattooing is even in how you describe your own tattoos as sort of this collaboration between you mm-hmm. and the tattoo artist is because you're choosing where it's going to go with the person and and how it relates to other tattoos it becomes this mm-hmm. evolving thing that is tied to your own identity and then mm-hmm. part of the identity of the artist are, is there as well. So it's super fascinating. I don't, but to answer your question, I don't think there is another art movement that is comparable 
with what we're talking about here. Um, and we could throw in a few other things like streetwear fashion, right? That, mm-hmm. that could be part of it. Um, the, I, I like to talk about when we talk about car culture as moving sculptures, mm-hmm. right? And all these things are associated with street culture in general. Uh, and there's a reason why Juxtapose as a magazine, the way it was founded, is more popular than any other fine art magazine out there. There's more subscribers to Juxtapose wow. than there are to Art in America or Art News or, you know, or, you know, any of the painting magazines that you, you know, there's like three copies at Barnes and Noble or something mm-hmm. like that. Cause you know what? People, you know, it's, it's just what's relevant. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, I, I love it. Um, and we haven't even touched upon like skateboarding or surfing or any, right. and those types of things are, they're all tied to right. the, the, the same genres that we're talking about. Which we have, you know, a lot of, um, Craig Stesick is in the show. That's right. Um, Dakota Gomez is, is in the show who's, you know, brought up around the surf culture and a big part of the, the surf community. Um, Jason Brown, um, from Venice, uh, you know, punk rock dude, um, does a lot of like cool skateboard graphics and, and, you know, but a lot of these, a lot of these artists have done skateboard graphics and, mm-hmm. and worked with skate companies, you know, obviously Mike Giant and, you know, all, just everybody kind of moves in that area too. Um, well, all these subcultures and we call them subcultures. I would say the various subcultures that are represented in this show all fall within the header in academia street culture, right? And mm-hmm. so it's not uncommon for an artist to move within them, as it shouldn't be uncommon for them to move within the various media represented. Just because you use aerosol doesn't mean you can't use X, Y, or Z medium. And that's that's what's great. I mean, that's what's so freeing about it. It used of this. to. Yeah. It used to, you know, the hardcore, the purists were like back in, you know, the early nineties, mid nineties was like somebody brought a brush or some tape or a stencil or something to a wall, you were you, you weren't doing it right and you were criticized for that. Art world was the same way. What medium do you work in? Was a question. <laughs> like uh, I do watercolor. It's like really? <laughs> That's yeah. the, you're stuck there. Yeah. Like so you once you choose that I use a acrylics that you're you're tied there I forever. Think, huh? I think from what I've seen and heard, people that have the ability to cross over, that's that's um appreciated and people people really respect that um i'll take somebody a great tattooer um carlos torres who's one of the most outstanding tattooers that i know personally and and consider a good friend but you look at his paintings his acrylics that he's doing and they're mind-blowing yeah and and you know a lot of these guys will tell you oh just some kid from the neighborhood but even his subject matter yeah. Like he does some crazy subject matter that looks, you know, Renaissance looking. Yeah. You know, there, there's just so many, um, so much talent. I, and I get, you know, it's it, it's exciting to me. It's really exciting to me. The show's, you know, I can't wait to see what some of these people end up, you know, bringing to the show. And then Jim and I got to get to work trying to hang this stuff. And- yeah. <laughs> well, well, good luck with that, Bobby. Yeah. I'm busy that week. Yeah. So, but uh, the, the backup from that, I mean, it's, you Technique, medium, super important. The thing that really gets me excited, though, is did it start with a concept? What's the idea? Because I can appreciate something that's really well done technically. But if it doesn't say something to me or if I can't continue to ask questions of the piece and it keeps coming back with different answers and the conversation doesn't get richer, well, I get bored. Yeah. And, and that's the problem. And so the great art should do that. And so that's what that's what I'm looking forward to at the show is a, a thinking about what's there, having the conversations with folks, visiting the artist, walking around that place dozens and dozens of time, and, and the conversations we'll have about it. Yeah, I'm gonna have to get a bicycle. Because <laughs> not just because of that, because the the there's other things that are gonna happen. Um, so the show runs from for two months. It opens on June 25th. That's the public opening, and it closes August 28th. So June twenty fifth, we're also going to have a big car show, a good sized car show, um, invitational. The cars will be handpicked by um, some members from Click Car Club, Elite Car Club, myself, Johnny, and um, you know <laughs> yeah. David DeBaca. So there's a, there's a group of us that are going to be kind of uh, selecting the cars, and it's more of a curated type show, if you will, and we're trying to showcase. You know, what, what we think will not just show well together, but you know, the, the, 
the cream of the crop, if mm-hmm. you will. Um, with all due respect to everybody else, and and obviously it's it's uh, you know it's our opinion subjective. So some yeah, people yeah. might go like, well, what about <clears throat> based on yeah. a lot of experience? Though. Yeah, and, and you know? I think the confusion is calling it a car show because everyone has that preconceived notion of a car show you sign up you pay 20 bucks and then you're there versus a a curated show um where you're showcasing right you know whatever the curator wants so we got to figure out what we could the exhibition because the last show we did i um san diego's finest it was a it was a low rider exhibition i think we call it but anyways it's an invitational yeah they're all these are absolutely invitationals um but it's gonna be on the 25th on the lawn, um, there's a lot of nice trees, and it, it's going to be a, you know, if all goes well, it's it'll be an amazing event. But um, yeah, I'm excited about the car show part of it, and I, and there'll be DJs, and there'll be, um, you know, food trucks and beverages and all the, all the good stuff, and and then <clears throat> moving forward, as of right now in July, we have a. Uh, we have a couple events planned also in the courtyard for the museum. Um, a couple music events that we're, we're putting together, hopefully with uh, the B side players, which will be Carlos Baez's uh, birthday. And then the following night, there'll be some local bands, including Bobo, my, my son's band and some of the bands that are, that he plays with and opens for. So he, you know, there'll be a, like a, a younger local music night. And then after that, um, we've been talking to DJ artistic about doing a battle bot and some hip hop stuff. Um, but there's other events that are being planned as well that I can't really speak on as of yet because the contracts aren't signed and things, but these would be things that were happening in the larger auditoriums, like the, the big theaters. So all this would, would correlate to the show. So it'd be like a night of music and art, a night of comedy and art, a night of, you know, whatever it is, um, so there's some other other things happening. So during that two month period, we'll be doing poster signings with a lot of the local guys and artists that are in the building. There's talk of workshops and things like that. So during that two month period, we're, we're, it's it'll be an experience. You yeah, know, really there'll will. be different different things going on and different reasons to to revisit and and come see what's going on. But I t- personally, I take a lot of. Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm really excited about it. It's it's something that I think it's a lifetime work for me. Like it's just doing this cuz I've never seen anything like it. There's been shows that are strictly street art and um graffiti. Great shows. One great show. I mean a couple great shows, but um the diversity of this one and and just all the elements that are included culturally and that's because they exist together Mm -hmm. they do exist you know the subtitle for the show is socal style masters it's street legacy socal style masters and and all of this exists around us like i mean here in the building daily you know you walk in and first thing you see is slappies and then you come into the store and there's spray paint and there's art and then you walk in a little further and there's tattoo shops and you know we're working on the cars in the back there's always you know, one or two low riders in here and it's, there's a music studio. So all these things that exist naturally, organically for us and not just us here, but all around us is kind of bringing it all together for, for people to really see how it fits. And it, it really does go together really, really well. And it's not the first time that we've done this, you know, there was legacy one, two and three, but this is another level. This is a, a museum show. This is you know, something that Jim's got his hands in and, and, you know, we're, I think we're, we're doing something that's, that's going to be very unique, exciting. And for people to really, you know, check out, talk about, and hopefully one day we'll get to get it to travel. That's what I'd really like is to put it on the road. So if you've got, (laughs) (laughs) so how receptive was the venue? Or the institution, the gym. The- that's what I'm saying. Like I couldn't have wrote the letter if I, if I would have wrote a letter and I would have put my name and my you know signed it. Who are they? Were, oh, hmm, we'll put uh, a, maybe I don't know maybe about that. they would have googled maybe. you. Maybe. But, 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 but yeah, yeah, they would have like Bobby. who's this? Who's this? Who's this dude? Oh, but yeah. but yeah. no. But this is this is and and you know I'll say something too is no matter how you look at it, credentials are very real. 
Like they're real. If somebody writes you and if you have any sort of you're in business or whatever and somebody you look at the way who they are, what they do, how they sign their name and you do a Google search and you look like, oh, OK, well, then I got to pay attention to this, you know, and you pay attention to everything. But there is a little degree of like, oh, this is no this is no bullshit. This is like the real deal. Like This is this person doesn't have or or is in the position that they're in because they're bullshitting all the time. This is something real. And I think that's what Jim brought to like when Jim, like the way he got my attention, like people, somebody, some, you know, I'll, I, I read the emails, I look at stuff, but when you are of, it's like getting a letter from, uh, you know, whoever it is, a, 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 just a person of, of stat, you know, status, yeah, well, it, you, it makes you, a difference. You always respond better or to someone when they're a peer, you know, whether it's in the same industry, the same, you know, whatever it may be, you respond better because you have that, that uh, common ground or base level of, of who they are and mm-hmm. versus some random guy, you know, right. trying to come mess up the grass there at the arts. Right. <laughs> but I mean, just, just you, you look at the, the, you know, the, just the credentials that, you know, if you're the professor, you're a dean, you're a doctor, you're a versus some dude, some dude. You know what I mean? Yeah. I not, not, not necessarily myself, but I'm just saying, like right. you, you, there's a little more seriousness to, and that's that's the advantage I think to having an education too, and 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 have been having earned those credentials is because you use those credentials to open doors, and people pay greater attention to you if you have credentials, and that's why you pay all this money to go to school and and earn these. I think yeah. too is is because they help you in life to to open doors and be able to do cool shit like this. I think museum, it's very nice. No, the, you, and, but, but the I mean, people, the mm-hmm. people, not to, to, to interrupt you too, yeah, but the people in the museum are amazing. Yeah. Like the pe- yeah, the people in the museum are amazing. Like they're, they're, they're really cool. And I've, I've got to um, know, know some of the people really, really well. And, and I think um, there's a couple instances where a little standoffish, but once, they got to know me and, and talked to me. They're like, oh, wow. Oh, they he's, love you. Yeah. They he's, absolutely, he's, he works wonders <laughs> with, uh, politically with the museum. I, I would say that, that I think the one thing as you're talking, I'm like, eh, museums operate a lot like academia and universities. I mean, it's a similar language and structure. So it's somewhat, it's part of it's a familiarity, right? So it's not as though um, Bobby wouldn't thrive he actually would and i i think he'd be a great board member or director of a museum he could run anything he wants to he's used to whoa it's true i mean and and they absolutely adore him and what he's bringing to the show so uh originally when we talked about doing this show i helped write a proposal and my idea was all right so we got a show good luck bobby (laughs) (laughs) and i really i really tried to step away i'm like it you got it and you're like no i'm only doing this if you can help me do it that's right (laughs) and i'm glad because we had like from the beginning i think we had an instant trust of each other Mm -hmm. and And so ability to talk shit to each other that's true yeah, but I'm faster. Yeah, I, no, I'm <laughs> yeah. it's pretty fast. Yeah. But I, I get in there once um, in a while. Easy. <laughs> but I, I, I'll never forget because uh, in doing some just initial research, you were so kind. You gave me um, these hard drives with a lot of your archives on it, mm-hmm. and we had just met, mm-hmm. and you didn't have backups for those archives. Yeah. And, I usually do. I have backups of backups, but on those but you did maybe not. Maybe I didn't. Yeah. You didn't. You remember telling you like, and and you you handed it to me because I trust you, and and I to me that was a very it, it was a it was an important moment. So mm-hmm. I appreciated that, and it, it kind of cemented a friendship early mm-hmm. on. That I'm like, I love this guy. I yeah, can, I can totally work with this yeah. guy. It's great. So yeah. it was it was just one of those little. It was a little thing, and it may not have meant much much to you at the moment, but to but, me, I was like, but That's just great. within the past couple of weeks. You know, the museum will ask us, like, he just turned in a, a press press release. Yeah. And, you know, I couldn't write that. Like, that. <laughs> like they wanted us to write. And, and when it comes to, you know, really bringing the show to another level um, with, you know, like things like a press release or or he knows he's trained how to he knows how to really curate a show. Like, I can go in, I can curate a show, but. I might be doing it wrong, <laughs> but but you know what I mean. Like just reading his the press release, just things that that need uh, that sort of attention. I think it, it brings the whole show up to um 
to another level. But well, speaking of, there's one other part of this show that I'm really proud of, and I know that you are oh, as yeah. well. And mm-hmm. it's a companion piece. And while it's not necessarily important, it's like it doesn't necessarily. It's very important. It, well, no, I said it won't, it's not necessarily that. Um, it's reflective of what's going to be in the show, but mm-hmm. there is going to be an academic text published uh, about tribal streetwear and the many subcultures that feed into it. It's going to be published by Intellect Books. They're based out of the UK. They're an academic publisher, and we chose them on purpose because they'll be placed in academic libraries and it'll be available as a resource. It's a peer-reviewed book. Uh, and it features over a dozen academic authors, as well as some long-standing friends of Tribal, as well as Bobby uh, doing a personal history. And so we look at Tribal streetwear and streetwear in general, the history of it, and how each of these subcultures plays an important part within it, reflecting on Tribal in general, but also the larger culture of where we're going with streetwear. I think it's going to make uh, an important contribution to the field and of street culture overall. I think it also puts tribal within academic conversations about the history of streetwear, fashion, these types of things. Uh, so I'm excited about that. Um, it's, a, it's a project that's taken a long time to get to this point. It's a lot of different authors. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty stoked about that, and we'll have more information as that gets released and, and published. That's, ex- that's exciting. Dude. That's next level stuff right there, Bonnie. It yeah. kind of is. Because people you know? are going to be writing their thesis and be citing that source. That's true. That's yeah. true. That shit's crazy. So, so, so the, the thing is, is, um, you know, I've been working on a book too and, and editing. Oh, you're trying and, to up me now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, but, but I understand like uh, there's a big difference between doing an academic piece and something that's used in universities and people actually study. Um, you know, it's used in college courses or, you're in the books and this can be an inter- something international people all over the world can, can, you know, it's available to them, not just on hard copy, but it'll be available digitally somewhere. Yeah. As a, as a, as a resource. So the idea is we want anyone to have a copy of it yeah. that they can. So it's open access is what we call that. So let's say like a, a grad student wants to do research, but can't afford the book, you know, let's say it's a $39 book, whatever, you know, they could download the article that they want that's mm-hmm. applicable to what they're trying to do. So that, you know, a coffee table books dope. Like I, I collect books. I have books with a lot of pictures and images and those are really cool, but I've got hundreds or thousands of books in my library. Um, but this is a book that is, uh, it's different and it's, it's something that, that I'm, I'm, I'm really, uh, honored that they're doing it. And <clears throat> some of the contributors are, you know, professors and PhDs and, and, um, academics and people that I got to speak with over the phone. Like I had to do some interviews with some of these, these authors, but they're all bringing in a very unique perspective. And the way that Jim's organized the books is, is there's people that are, you know, they're known as, you know, graffiti specialists or surf culture, or whatever it is, um, you know, California skate, what, you know, whatever, uh, Denise, as far as, you know, low rider culture and, and yeah. things like that. So it's broken up into all these different ways that we've contributed to these different cultural elements, if you will, internationally. And, and then just this, this thing that we did over the last 33 years that had never been done before. And it's, it's kind of, um, you know, it's like a, le- it's a legacy piece and, and it's, I'm really proud of it and excited to, and I tried to read it. <laughs> 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 no, I read it, but um I learned some things. Like I, I learned a lot. Yeah. And and it's 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 a college course. Like this book it's I mean, I don't think the whole book's a college course, but it's college level. It's it's not, you know, it's, it's not lower division reading. It's uh, not meant to be, right? Yeah, it's not <laughs> yeah. meant to be. This, yeah, it's not lower research. division reading. Like yeah. this is this is some the real deal. So yeah. it's it's cool because like we do stuff normal because we grew up that way, we've lived in the environment, but there's like data that that is analyzed on either a psychological, social, whatever, that they people that 
analyze like you or, or the business or, or street culture in general, they can put it in a book like this so other people can understand. Absolutely. It. that You're absolutely right. And people, we take it for granted, like you were saying, like, because we've lived amongst it and it is who we are. But, you know, maybe um, some kids in, in Berlin or some college students in Berlin that have grown up around their lifestyle, they're going to be like, wow, all this came, this was how it went down in Southern California. And this was, and here's some you know, some links and some, the the book will have photos and it'll have images as well. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, not to the extent of like a book that's primarily image images and and, and photos and stuff. So, but yeah, I'm excited about that. And that's going to be ready on time. It's uh, things move (laughs) slow in academia, but uh, the idea is it come out this summer. So here's, we're crossing our fingers, but, uh, but you know, and we've talked about this, we want it done right. So uh-huh. Uh, to me, it's if it came out a month later, I'd be yeah. totally fine with that. I just want it done yeah. well. Yeah, and I, I I appreciate that. So yeah, that's that's another exciting element. Um, and then there'll be other items that we're going to be producing exclusively for the show. There'll be um, some really cool merch things, some you know, obviously art posters, and some other cool stuff that that will, will be surprises. Um, once they're released in in the the gift shop or at the at the show, but it's exciting, man. That's cool. Can't yeah. wait. Can't wait to <laughs> dive know. into that book. Yeah. The yeah the both the uh, both books actually. Yeah, it's uh it's crazy. So, so um, what else, Jim? Are, are you? <laughs> well, are, 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 I, I have mean, a question. I, yeah. So, out of all the art, why did you like focus, or why what draw drew you to? Street art. To focus on street art at one point. Well, my dissertation when I wrote it was um, a biography about a 19th century artist and designer who worked within the English or the British schools of design. And so um, my background has really been a lot of academic art. Um, But what grad school and that kind of research teaches you, you can research anything. You just, you learn the tools so you can apply them. Mm -hmm. So when I had a few years into teaching uh, at uh, university level, my students love street art. I mean, that's all they talked about in my contemporary art history. I taught contemporary art history, modern art history. And so in doing, and and I was interested and I wrote a few reviews about folks um, for some of the local Los Angeles magazines where I'd do art reviews. And, um, I started surveying, like, like, what's the literature look like in street art graffiti? And I was really disappointed, you know, as you, I would go and I I had this, developed this very large library of it. And they tended to be first person accounts of things, buddies writing about other buddies, um, fans writing about ABC books on, hey, here's like an artist that starts with an A and let's work (laughs) through the alphabet, like literally and mostly image based. And the content was two or three feet deep. You know, it was really shallow. Uh, and at that time, there really wasn't much academic work. There's a lot more now. Uh, so my my idea was there wasn't one on L.A. at that point, a, a street art book on L.A. And there certainly wasn't an academic one. So I thought there could be a niche there. And I didn't know a lot about it, but that seemed to be perfect uh, in investigating. So it ended up being... A, a real study interviewing over a hundred artists. I knew one before that. <laughs> wow. So I knew one street artist in LA and it started with a phone call and I used a snowball technique and that's, you, you, you do that in interview based research at the end of your interview, you asked, do you have two or three other people you'd recommend that I talk to for this study? And that's <laughs> after they go through the questions, they realize how serious you are and who you are and that you're doing a real study and they recommend two or three people. And then, by the end, towards the end, I started getting, I was wondering when you were going to call, <laughs> you know? So like the name got out there, people were talking. And when the book finally came out, no one was surprised in that field. So that's how it started. And then, you know, you start to get asked to do smaller yeah. articles what's here the name, or there. What's the name of that book? That book was called uh, Stay Up Los Angeles Street Art. And the other books that you've done? After that, it was Shepherd Ferry Incorporated, Artist Professional Vandal, which was... Um, Half bio, half criticism on the art and life of Shepard Ferry. I did a bio- unauthorized. That was unauthorized, which was really fun. Even though he, I did get access to 
everything that I needed mm -hmm. along the way. I did an authorized bio on Kenny Scharf, you know, one of the the pillars of early street art. Who will be doing a large mural? That's lar right. The largest mural at the at the event. Yeah, we got permission from the city to do a permanent mural on the side wow. of the museum by Kenny. Say, can, can you tell them a little bit about who Kenny is for the yeah, listener? Yeah, so. Um, Back in the 80s, it was uh, Keith Haring, Jean-Michel, and Kenny Scharf that came Keith, onto he, the street art scene. Yeah, yeah. Jean-Michel Basquiat. Uh, Keith uh, Haring and Kenny Scharf were best friends. They were in college together. Uh, Jean-Michel kind of lived on the street, but also went back home and back and forth. And the three of them all became very good friends. Um, Basquiat was more of a rival, probably. I would describe him as a rival of Scharf. Uh, all of them got taken into some of the larger galleries. I know they had several different folks that represented them, but mentored by Warhol during that time, all three of them owned paintings by Warhol and Warhol bought wow. works by them. Early eighties, they were selling work for a hundred thousand. I mean, wow. it, was, it was insane. I mean, that's in the eighties. So, uh, the book's called in absence of myth as a subtitle. And the reason is both Basquiat and Herring died tragically and when you die, we build up myths about who you are as a person. My goodness, you all and all of our listeners have seen imagery by Herring and Basquiat. But do you really know who they were? What kind of person they were? Probably not. You probably have bought into the cartoon that the little characters they sell at the museum of both of them, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like a real person. Uh, Kenny didn't die. He continued to live, and he continued to live when the 80s fell out from the bottom and the art market crashed, and then what do you do? Uh, and then since kind of rising from that and, of course, becoming a very prominent artist now in the contemporary scene and getting a lot of wonderful critical attention, it was nice to write that story because it's an interesting story. It's not just a, hey, I made it really early, I'm super famous and wealthy, but no, there was a lot of struggle, and then there is a redemptive part of that story altogether so um he lives in los angeles uh his studio is here and spent um, a few years interviewing him and writing that book it was a really wonderful time and what a wild life so it's a it's a pleasure to have the city be really excited about a mural like that and in a way it becomes a permanent piece of the museum's collection mm -hmm. the city's collection yeah. Uh, it's a big wall. Yeah, it's a big wall. And they described it to me as, thank you for bringing this jewel to Escondido. They're really, really excited about yeah. it. Yeah, it's awesome. It's, it's, see, it's our hometown, John. Which wall is it? It's it's the, you know, if you're going into the gallery, mm -hmm. the side on the right, that there's a big oh, wall. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like the whole size of the, the gallery. It's the backside of the museum, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It faces the park. Yeah, that's 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 awesome. So the, car, the there. cars, it'll be, when we do the car show, we're going to make sure there's no pop-ups or any obstruction. So the cars will be laid out so you can get the Kenny Scharf mural on behind the cars. Can't wait. Yeah. It's, me neither. It'd be dope. Yeah. But um, where were we? I, I interrupted you. No, was, uh, that's so that's who Kenny was. Yeah. It is, 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 and continues to be, so... Uh, stoked about that possibility and or you, that what that is what, what, is. what also is cool is like uh, um, there's stuff about artists that are either recent in recent history or um, that are still alive that you're bringing because most of the artists are like you said the myth right they they pass away and then their their value goes up but um, you know it's past stuff that we can recall in our life but the 80s you know we remember the 80s yeah, yeah. well so. most of them <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's the story I always hear, right? Yeah. It's like, so that, 80s that, were a blur. Yeah, but um, I guess we'll wrap it up. Um, is there anything else that you want no, to say? No, I, I appreciate being here with both of you. This is It's been an awesome project, well, we, so it's fun we, to we talk We had about. to do this, too. I mean, we're just we're both really excited about the show, and, and you know, I think people are curious to know exactly what's going on, and that, that kind of gives you a peek inside it. Um, did you give dates? I did. I could do it again. June right? 25th, right? That's right. Public. Get them, Johnny. Yeah. Keep Other going. than that, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Two months. Yeah, that's Two right. Months. Yeah. June 25th, uh, California Center for the Arts in Escondido is the big opening show, um, car show, art show. And and we're doing our very best, and we believe that it's everything should be free, right? Free show, um, unless something changes. But as of right now, it, it should be a free show. Um, the car show, music, you know, beer, and the, the, the show runs from June 25th till August 28th. 
Um, there'll be several other events within that two month period. There'll be, um, you know, poster signings, some workshops, some music events, uh, possibly some comedy, um, just some really, really cool stuff happening during that two month period. Um, this is one you don't want to miss. I think this is one that, that's, that's, uh, unique. Um, it's going to be one that people will talk about for years, I think. And, um, that's it. Street Legacy 2022, right? That's right. I'm excited. Another, another plus that'll draw a lot of people is I'll be walking around there so <laughs> you can say what's up. And, yeah. yeah. Yep. And I'll just be lecturing out yep. in the Johnny, <laughs> Johnny's, Johnny's working on his uh, his tight tank top bod. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but there'll be a lot of good people there, too. Yeah. Like there'll, it, there'll be a lot of really, really cool people. And, and just on a side note, I, I feel extremely fortunate and blessed and, and thankful that so many artists are willing to contribute to this project Absolutely. with us. And, and it wouldn't be anything without these artists. Like Jim and I could, could, you know, talk all the shit we want, but it wouldn't be anything without the contributors and the people that are, that are making the show what it is, not just the visual artists, but you know, um, the car owners and the DJs and the people that are, that are going to be doing multiple things throughout, throughout the, you know, the period of the show, but, um, that's it. Street legacy. Awesome. 2022. So I'm going to close this out. Dr. Jim Dacian. Um, he, his IG is. It's at Jim Dacian. And it's spelled. And I always do this for him. Cause if you, if you hear Dacian, you're like D A Y. No. D A I C H E N D T. Wow. I did it. We right? are friends. Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had to do that a couple times. That is really good. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for being here. Johnny, be good as always. He, he, and extra shout out to Johnny because Johnny's always, you know, handling the tech and puts up with my non techiness. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that was the word I was yeah. looking See, for, but, but shout out to right you. There. And uh, thanks for listening. Lower Left Podcast. Uh, Tribal Click 17th and Island We're out